My guest today is Ben Bergeron. Ben is the coach to CrossFit champions, as well as people who just enjoy CrossFit on the day-to-day, and he has his own gym. And this is a conversation that I've looked forward to since I started the podcast, since his book, Chasing Excellence, is the reason or one of the reasons why I started the podcast to begin with. And in this conversation, we spoke about why he quit his job after 9-11. We spoke about the challenges of the mental framing of life and the examples he used to explain how you can change your life by changing the way you look at the world. And I was left after this conversation very inspired, ready to get a workout in and just really excited to bring you this conversation. This podcast is brought to you by My First Million. My First Million is a podcast hosted by two creators and entrepreneurs, Sam and Sean, who are brilliant. They are so funny, informative, interesting, and insightful. And the way they're able to tell stories about business and technology is leaves you curious about the future and where this all is going. So I listen to it pretty religiously, and I recommend it to all my friends as well. So they're sponsoring the podcast to let more people know about My First Million. So you should go check it out wherever you listen to podcasts. Well, Ben, thank you for coming on the show. I mean, you don't know this, but in August of 2020, I went out to a cabin in the woods and for five days, no technology, just brought myself, my mind, started to meditate and started to just get clear on what I wanted out of life. And one of the books that I brought was Chasing Excellence. Mm. And it hit me at that perfect time where I was so in it and I could fully immerse myself in the book and it made a real impact on me. So I want to thank you for uh, what you've written and the life you've lived. That's amazing, Danny. Thank you, man. That's really cool. When you accepted the request to come on the podcast, a tear came down my eye. And that hasn't happened for any guest out of the 280 that I've had so far. So I'm, I'm really grateful for you. I didn't know that that would happen. And I'm curious from your perspective, have there been any moments for you on your journey that have been so impactful that either a synchronicity or an event that it caused you to cry unexpectedly? I wouldn't say I'm a crier, <laughs> uh, but I would say that one of the most impactful and yes, I, I, I cried um, when this happened and many times um, following the event, whenever the event comes up and that's 9-11. 9-11 was the most transformative experience of my life. You seem like you're a lot younger than I am, so I don't know if you remember it the way that 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 I didn't have it impact me and um, you know, it's basically the, that, that set the trajectory for my life. I was uh, doing finance just literally just two blocks that way. We're in Boston right now. And when that happened, it, it shook me to my core and rattled me to the point where I questioned everything. Kind of like when you went to your, your five days in the woods, I did something similar. I spent five months in Wyoming trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I didn't know about meditation or solitude or anything at that time. Luckily, technology was not a big thing. So if I wanted to use the internet, I'd go to the library, Wyoming being what it was, the public library. And that's the thing that set the trajectory for my life is I realized what I wanted to do more than anything else was to have impact. I just wanted to, I wanted to um, not be a rat on a wheel I didn't want to go through the motions of life. I wanted to have purpose and passion. I want a life of fulfillment. I want a life of um, activity. I felt like I was rotting away behind a computer in a cubicle. And, you know, when that happened, I was I was incredibly motivated by the heroic acts of those days. And I was either going to join the military or become a firefighter. And there was a lot of... Um, logistics and red tape and some constraints for both of those things. And I ended up realizing that the way I could have impact 
on a really different level than those two was to help people become better versions of themselves. And I did start with that in a, in the physical domain of personal training. And that led to becoming a strength coach, finding CrossFit, the CrossFit community, opening up a gym, and then eventually training high level athletes and all the way to the regular soccer moms and dads and realizing that this, this physicality, yes, it's important. Yes, it matters for health, but it ends up being the accelerator for the mind. Like when you put someone through these hard, challenging physical tasks, you can't not be aware of what the mind is doing. And I think most of us navigate life every single day on autopilot. And that's one of the amazing things about what we do every day. And I'm a pr privileged to be able to do every day in working with athletes and everyone else is seeing the adaptations that yes, happen physically, but the adaptations that happen between the years and allowing people to navigate their lives in a more productive way because they're more physically capable, but also because they're more steadfast, they're more disciplined, they're more centered, they don't get thrown off course, they can um, handle more, both physically and mentally. And that's a really exciting thing when you hear the stories of, you know, people saying like, you know, this thing used to, I used to get really kind of rattled by this or that. And they're like, and that happened to me yesterday. And I recognized it in real time that this was happening, that this would have been something that would have thrown me off course in the past. And I was kind of not only able to handle, but recognize it in real time and kind of go, that's weird that that used to throw me off course. That used to rattle me. That used to get me upset. That used to cause anxiety. That used to be a very stressful thing for me. And it wasn't that at all this time. That is um, so fulfilling for me to be a part of that journey. So the long answer to your to your very simple question was 9-11 um, was for sure that moment. And whenever it comes up again, I have the conversation with you know my gym that the reason this place exists is because of that, that um, tragic event. What would have happened to you had 9-11 not happened? How long or if ever would you have gotten shaken to your core to make a change, do you believe? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. It's, um, I don't know if it would have been um, months, years, or decades, or never. Like some people I think, you know, it, I had a really secure job and a really good company with a nice corporate ladder to climb. The impetus for a change was not there. So it would have taken a big, bold, brave step. Um, and I think that 9-11 was the thing that kind of like enough, um, you know, a kick in the pants to go like, dude, this is not what you want with your life. And, you know, I see, I see a lot of people that go through the motions for a really long time. And yes, they're doing what seemingly we are told to do, right? They, they're getting the, they have the six figures, they have the, the two car garage, they have the, the corner office, they have their two weeks vacation that they can take in the Caribbean or skiing with their family on the weekends. But the majority of their lives, and this is the way I kind of look at it is I like to think of our lives as three eight hour pieces one of those pieces is eaten by sleep so it's gone so we're all we all should be sleeping eight hours and there's the hour before getting ready maybe the hour getting up so even if you sleep six hours it's pretty close to that eight hours so eight of our lives is taken up that box is fully colored in we don't have much control over it well then there's the eight hours you're spending working that's a re that's essentially half of your life is spent working. And then there's the other eight hours, which I like to think of as four hours before work and four hours after work. Most people are trying re I would hope that most people are at least trying to make those four before and four after 
as productive, meaningful, and intentional as possible. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the case, but that's what I would love to bring awareness to, is that this is the little bits of time, these four hours, they go by really quick. If we're not intentional with those four hours, your life from Monday through Friday disappears. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like step one for me. So that's like, can we put in some healthy practices and disciplines? Can we as you said, can we meditate? Can we exercise? Can we be intentional with the way we're spending our time with our family and growing and learning, whether that's a side hustle or reading or studying? Or are we just going on autopilot where we are zombies snoozing, drinking our coffee as we go through this unconscious routine in the morning, sitting in traffic, you know, scrolling through social media, only get to a job that we then don't find purpose, passion, meaning in, and then we just rinse, wash, repeat in the evening, come home, pour ourselves a drink, eat bad, take out food, watch three hours of Game of Thrones, try to you know go to bed, but instead we scroll social media in our beds, and we're living a life on autopilot. Mm. Based off of our past paradigms and our past programming with no intention of what we're trying to create in the future, and it really does come down to the the accumulation of the small things. And this is what people miss is if you start to start a practice of I'm going to have a salad instead of the takeout. Well, you do that for a day and there's no difference. You don't feel different. You don't look different. You're no healthier. Your biomarkers aren't better. The doctor doesn't say, good job. What have you been doing? Nothing happens. It's only after choosing the salad instead of the takeout when you choose that for six months, a year, two years, or five years. Certainly when you've done that for 10 years, there's a massive discrepancy between doing the takeout and the salad every night. And this is what the challenge for us all is, is can we become aware mm. of the small things that make the big differences? Now, those are the small things. To me, one of the huge ones is how are you spending that eight hours at work? Mm. That's a massive one. But that's a big, brave, bold step to make a change there. But if we can do that, if we can choose to do what sets our heart on fire, that to me ends up in a place where we look back at our lives and go, whoa, I'm, I'm really thankful. I'm really grateful. I'm really proud. I'm really happy that I was able to spend my life intentionally pursuing that. Okay. So let's uh, say hypothetical situation here. Somebody is in a job or a situation that they think is good, but it's not great. And it's not making them feel excited every day. And they want to go away. They heard you go away for some period of time. They heard me go away for some period of time mm -hmm. and get clear on a purpose, a vision, a place we wanted to direct our attention what types of questions should somebody ask themselves to get clear on their values or the places that they want to go? Great question. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> um, but the first part I would say is you don't necessarily have to go away, right? Mm -hmm. That's a big ask to carve out a week to go find yourself or five months right. to go find yourself. And this is where the practice of silence, solitude, stillness, meditation, nature, journaling, like is one of these types of practices comes in big because I don't know what's more beneficial. Is it the five days of complete or is it the five minutes every single day? There's not a better or worse there, but I would say that the five minutes every day is probably a more bite-sized chunk that people can carve out. But again, it's one of these practices that after you do this for a week, you might see no returns on it. So people go, listen, I've been put, I've been meditating for five day, five minutes every single day for five days. I don't see any return on that investment. So why should I even bother continuing with that? And again, it's, that's the discipline. Discipline is when you are doing the behaviors that you don't, that you believe are the right behaviors and you continue to do them like you love them, mm -hmm. 
even though you don't, even though you are not seeing immediate return on investment. Because if you go and um, immediately start doing a really big um, workout program where you're going to go and I'm going to work out for two hours every single day. Well, if you work out for two hours every single day, after a week, you're going to see returns. But that's a huge ask. Like most people can't do that. What most people are going to do is work out for 30 minutes three times a week. And after the week, they don't see any difference. Well, the challenge then becomes, do you have the discipline, the fortitude, the willpower to continue to do that practice for an extended period of time? And then over the years, that pays the dividends. So whether it's five days, five months, or five minutes to each their own. Mm. And then the questions then become, to me, the number one question that we should all be asking ourselves all of the time is, what is the best use of my time? It's the, I like, it's one of the only non-renewable resources. If you spend your money, you can earn your money back. If you, um, you know, there's a lot of things that resources that you have. Time is one that we're not getting back as, at least as far as we know, right? We don't know if we're going to come back and have this again, but this is the only life that we know. So based off of those, that reality, I think that our time is the one that our time is, we should always be thinking about, is this the best use of my time? And in order to do that appropriately, I think we need to bring some perspective and um, look at this present moment almost like we're looking at it in hindsight. Because only with enough hindsight can we go, yes, that was the right choice. Because in the moment, you're going to lean on temptations. You're going to lean on... um, Uh, what's going to bring more pleasure in this moment. So it's not, I don't believe that we should be chasing um, what feels good right now. And that's the pleasure seekers. And that's people that, listen, I'm just going to travel the world. Well, you could end up traveling the world and having so much joy in, in that moment and entertainment in that moment. But after two decades, you look back and go, well, where was the real impact? Where was the real growth? Where was the real, and not to say that it's not a worthwhile endeavor. It might be the exactly the right thing you should do. But um, the extreme example of that is, well, what's the thing that's going to cause the most happiness and pleasure right now? Well, let's go party, dude. Mm-hmm. Like that's super, let's go, let's watch Netflix in our spare time. Let's scroll social media because that's super enjoyable. And in we, we have something to plan. Let's plan a party and go, go hang with the boys and meet the ladies because that's the thing that's going to bring the most pleasure. Well, rinse, wash, repeat that long enough, and that's a pretty empty existence. Mm. Because to me, what we want to actually do is ask ourselves, on our deathbed, we're going to all, this is, this is where, you know, begin with the end in mind. I believe that if we end up in the place where we are able to look back, you know, meaning that we don't have some acute trauma that the bus takes us out, you know, but we are in our, we're in our late 80s. We're 90 years old. We're lucky enough to make it to 100. In those last years, I, I think we're all going to look back and go, did we do that right? Mm. Did we spend our time there well? So that's the first thing is where are we spending our time? But here's the thing is time is not even the most important thing because you can be spending time with somebody But if we're not focused, it doesn't mean much. Mm. We could go out to a dinner together and I'm spending time with you. But if I'm scrolling social media the whole time, that it's not a worthwhile time because my focus isn't there. So focus is really the resource that we want to be doing. So that's what we should be asking ourselves is where should I be putting my focus? Because I fell in this trap. Once my business was established, I'm a, um, an entrepreneur with a fairly uh, established business of 10 years, and I have two young kids. So I'm like, hey, this is my chance. I'm going to 
go home every day at three o'clock so I can spend the whole afternoon at home with my family every single day. You did this? I did this. Wow. Sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. Like that's like, I'm, I'm doing the thing. I'm cause I asked myself, where should I be spending my time? And I was like, well, I have the opportunity. This is why I became an entrepreneur. So I have the freedom. So every day I go home at three o'clock and I'm there, but I'm not focused on my kids, my family, and my household. I go home at three o'clock and I bring my computer at my work home. So I'm at the kitchen table, but I'm doing email. I'm doing programming. I'm running the business at home. So yes, I'm at home, but I'm not focused on that. And that's now I'm not doing two things well. I'm not running my business well because I'm at home and getting the distraction of the kids tugging on my pants going, hey, daddy, let's go play. Let's go do this. I'm like, hey, no, no, I got to just do this. And I realized it's about focus and more time, less focus is not a win. Mm. And that's where I realized, no, I should be coming home at six o'clock. When I come home at six o'clock, I don't even bring my computer home. I come home at six o'clock and my phone goes in a drawer and I don't look at either until the next morning. And now I have the focus. I have the focus at work. And what I also was doing at the time, I had young kids, is up until three o'clock, I would bring my kids to work. Mm. And now I'm not doing work well. So it was this massive distraction. I think I'm doing all the right things by asking this question, what should I be doing with my time? Well, I should be doing my family and this, and that's first. What I realized is when I'm at work, I should be doing work. And I can focus on the work. And when I go home, now I'm super focused at home. And when I'm on the weekends, I don't do any work on the weekends. And that real division of church and state, of family and work, has been so clarifying that I feel like, and maybe I'll have some moment, new moments of clarity and um, growth, but right now this feels way better. It's what I've been doing for the last five or six years. As you become more successful and you clearly have had a bunch of successes, more and more people will be telling you that you're doing the thing right and that you bring your kids to the gym. This is awesome. You're the best, Ben. You're the best dad and you're the best coach. How do you maintain a level of understanding of yourself and ability to make decisions so that as you get more successes, you don't also believe your own bullshit? I think it's how you define success. Mm. And, you know, when you're younger, for sure, and maybe not even younger, but society tells us success is achievement. Mm. And it's the accolades, it's the awards, it's the applause. Success is when you get a lot of attention and people say, wow, and they, they uh, applaud what you've accomplished. If that's your definition of success, you're going to constantly be chasing next. It's you'll, you really won't have a level of fulfillment. And at one point, do you um, flip the switch? And what I've seen through my anecdotally, through my experiences and my friends and my family, is there is no success. There is no finish line because there is no, it's all, you have to get the next thing. If you define your success differently, then you you don't feed into the BS that way because you're, you've defined success in a different area. And to me, success is fulfillment. And when you're living in the present moment with, it's two things. It's with fulfillment, meaning I believe that what I'm doing is filling my heart, not my bank account. Not that that doesn't matter. It does because it, you need that for the second thing, with fulfillment and freedom. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason I became an entrepreneur in the beginning was because I wanted that freedom. I wanted to control my schedule. I wanted to do what I was passionate about. I wanted to um, lead in, um, and follow my own vision both for my life and for my business. So to me, my, my definition of success is fulfillment and freedom. Mm. And that um, is something that those two things play off of each other. 
because once you've had certain levels of quote success the way society would determine that should allow you the freedom to start to you know the the saying is climb your second mountain Hmm. which is to have impact and be with the people that matter to you if you don't have that level of perspective you're just constantly chasing the next this is what you hear all the time like Tom Brady, you've won seven Super Bowls. Which one's your favorite? And his answer is the next one. Well, there's zero. There's no levels of fulfillment there. You, at some point, if you want to climb the second mountain, which the second mountain is the one that creates fulfillment and impact, you go, listen, I have all of the financial security I need to go and do this thing that I believe will be more impactful. And that's where you see some brave people leave... And it's, they're able to walk away from the egocentric thing where they want the applause. They need the accolades. They need the attention. You go, I don't need that as much. I can do what fills my cup. Truly m- me, which is, I believe it has to do something to do with our our shared inner and outer purpose. And if you think about like life in terms of everyone goes like, what is our purpose in life? That's, that's, that's a really kind of big, confusing question. But if you break it down into a little framework of our inner purpose is to grow and evolve individually. And that's, not necessarily to get another zero in your bank account. That's not necessarily to climb the corporate ladder, but you as a person to grow, to become a more formidable, centered human being. It seems to make sense that that would be a shared purpose because it has to do with evolution. If we all do that, we are furthering the human race by doing it ourselves. And then our outer purpose seems to, it seems to make sense that That one isn't shared, that it's individual to you, and that that outer purpose would have something to do with helping others. And that outer purpose can change from moment to moment, year to year, and decade to decade. And I think this is why people get confused when they talk about purpose, and they need to find their purpose, which is such a challenging thing. And I feel like I can't find it. I don't know what it is. Well, what if your purpose, Danny, was just to be the best Danny possible? Like that's what it's about. And in order for that to happen, you have to ask yourself, what's the best way I can use my time and what should I be focusing on? And it it has to do with making Danny better. Okay, that seems to make sense. I, I can get on board with that. And then your outer purpose is right now, Danny, what is it? Well, right now in this moment, it's to... Be as present as you possibly can to make this as beneficial a conversation between the two of us. But then on a bigger scope, it's to make this podcast as impactful and powerful as you can while still having as much meaningful relationships as you possibly can and not numbers but in depth of relationships and impacting other people's lives and helping them out. And maybe you grow a platform big enough to be able to have massive impact on massive amounts of people and that sounds pretty cool. But when you're 50, maybe that's purpose and passion shifts and changes. And it should because you're growing and evolving as a person and your outer purpose should not be the same at 22 is at 42 as it is at 62 or 82. That can evolve and change as Danny grows to be a more evolved being as well. And circumstances, environment, the world changes. You couldn't have, nobody could have, I'm going to create the best podcast in the world as a, as an outer purpose 50 years ago. That mm-hmm. didn't, wouldn't even be an option. So purpose, the outer purpose can, should change, shift and evolve. But the inner, let's make Danny the best possible Danny. I feel like that could be something that we could all get on board with. Absolutely. You have a, a quote that you 
you took from Eckhart Tolle, which surprised me to see an Eckhart Tolle quote from a fitness trainer, but you know, it was one of my favorites as well. So you said the universe will give you exactly what you need for the evolution of your consciousness. This is a beautiful quote. When I heard you say it, I wrote it down immediately. And it's, I believe from a new earth mm-hmm. by, by Eckhart Tolle. So definitely worth checking out the book because that was another book I brought with me on that Very trip. Cool. But why, why that quote? Why did that quote speak to you so much? And why did you continue to repeat it? it it's, I think that's so much depth in those few words. Mm. So the first is evolution. So I, 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 as I just alluded to, I think evolution, if we got on board with that, it, it gives us so much purpose and power to our lives. It's like that, it seems like whether you're a salamander, um, a redwood tree in California, or a human being, that in and of itself, evolution seems to be a thing that we um, should not only understand, but it should help further. And if we can each become more formidable, healthier, stronger, fitter, faster, all of that, but also live with more um, happiness and joy, peace of mind, and we're able to do that for the next generation to help them do that, well, if we are to come back around and do this again, wouldn't that be such a worthy pursuit? And then this level of consciousness, which is the, ex- the opposite of consciousness is unconsciousness. So what we want to be able to do is navigate life consciously. Like if we're unconscious, that seems to be kind of the, the, the most disrespectful thing we could do for this incredible opportunity we have and the chances of us being here is uh, multi-trillions to one. It's almost the rarest thing that we could possibly happen is to be here in this moment. So it seems to me as to evolve our consciousness, to evolve our being awoken Mm. to something that we should be purposefully spending these rare moments we have, this glimpse, this snap of the fingers, this hundred years, which is so short. Wow, that seems like a cool way to navigate life with a an evolved, searching to continually evolve our consciousness, our awakeness, um, bring perspective to this moment right now. Well, then, if you if you kind of layer in that the universe at every moment is giving you the opportunity purposefully for that to happen. Right now, this conversation, if we are present enough, if we are not operating off of our past programming or projecting our future fears or anxieties, but living in this moment right now, which also as an athlete and a coach, what that's called is being in the zone or a flow state. So this is the thing. The universe is constantly giving you these bite-sized moments for you to not only evolve your consciousness, become more awake, become more purposeful, but to allow you to live in a flow state where it allows you, what that means is your very best just comes out of you. Because the things that pull you away from that is distraction. Distraction is the thing that pulls you away from a flow state. So think of a river flowing calmly. Like just think of a beautiful, calm river. That's a flow. Now, 
all of the energy of that river is flowing towards a meaningful destination, a beautiful, pristine lake. If we have distractions, what that means is we throw a few boulders into that lake. Now visualize that. What happens is once you put a few boulders into that lake, there's eddies, there's rapids, there's spray, and the lake doesn't flow as smoothly. And in fact, some of the lake doesn't even make it, sorry, some of the river doesn't even make it to that beautiful, pristine lake. It's wasted energy. Those boulders represent the distractions that take us away from a flow state. If we can recognize distractions when they're happening, and by the way, what those distractions are, yes, they could be, we're trying to do something purposeful. We're trying to write our manuscript. We're trying to focus on a workout. We're trying to have a meaningful conversation. And they could be the, the things that distract the five senses. They could be all of a sudden it gets really hot in here and oh God, this is freaking hot. Like, or it could be the alarm goes off and we hear this thing, or it could be this chair all of a sudden is really uncomfortable and I feel something different or all of a sudden something off in the corner, there's a bright light. And so you see something through the five senses and those distractions are really obvious when they happen to us. And we recognize those are distractions. What in, what an evolved consciousness recognizes is that our greatest distractions are not coming in through the five senses. They're the stories we tell ourselves, which end up as stories. Big time storytelling is called a drama. Mm. That's what drama is. We're creating the dramas of our lives. And those represent themselves as anxieties or fears about the future or guilt regrets, unease about the past. Hmm. Those are the boulders we're putting into our beautiful flowing river. And if we can recognize that, how do we live in more of a present flow state? You remove the boulders. Hmm. That's it. You, have, you become aware of, oh my gosh, I don't need to have that level of distraction in my life. I don't need to have those fears and anxieties. I don't need to have that regret and guilt about the past. Those are made up things that I imaginarily put into this flowing river. And I can allow, and by the way, again, if the boulders are in there, we're wasting energy. It's causing spray and eddies and rapids and it's getting thrown off onto the shore and not all of us gets to be at peace. That flowing river with no rocks is peaceful. Mm. That peace of mind is a flow state. When we talk to athletes that are in the zone. They're just in that moment. And if you want to distract someone away from being in that moment, you ask them to think and problem solve a little <laughs> bit more. So if you take somebody that's like, you're going golfing with somebody and they're just playing out of their mind, you go, oh my gosh, you're playing out of your mind. What have you changed in your swing? All of a sudden now what's happened is they put a boulder and now they're starting to think about, and they start thinking about that and they go, I don't know, what have I changed? Was it my backswing? Am mm. I hitting with more, am I shifting my weight differently? Or even worse, you go, you're playing out of your mind. I think you're gonna have your best game ever. This could be, if you do this, if you play your best game ever, think of what the guys at the clubhouse are going to say. Your handicap's going to come down. All of a sudden, you're going to be one of the best players in the club, and now they start projecting out in the future. You go, oh my, oh my gosh. Or you say, you're playing out of your mind. Remember that last time you played out of your mind, but on hole number seven, all of a sudden you shot it in the bunkers and you had all that thing, and now you're playing. That's pulling people out of a flow state. Hmm. To me, that the universe is constantly giving you opportunities for you to evolve your consciousness, to become more aware, more awoke, more un, um, um, present with this thing that we call the thinking mind. Other people call it the ego. Freud, Freud called it the id, and there's lots of names for it, but 
what we are, what we have as our base is you have your mind and your body. There's also energy, but we, that kind of like is a subset of, the, if you think about evolving your mind and your body, people get the body part. I got to go to the gym. I got to eat right. I got to exercise. I got to take the stairs instead of the elevator. Um, I got to um, eat healthy. I got to do the things that take care of my body. But when it comes to the mind, there's just autopilot. There's just programming. And this is why I love that quote. Mm. Because it's not only the evolution of our bodies, it's the evolution of our consciousness. And if we look at every moment being purposely put in front of you for that, well, now any sort of challenge, trouble, adversity, things that don't line up with your expectations are not negatives. They're not even positives. This is what's happening for you, not to you. This is what's happening for you. So you can evolve your consciousness. And if we recognize this with some of the smaller things, so you get stuck in traffic on your way to a meeting, to this meeting right here, and you're like, oh my God, I invited Ben on this podcast and I'm going to be late. And you recognize that shift in your energy. Well, can you just recognize that and go, okay, can I just sit in this moment not being disturbed by this outside events? And then you get to work on some of the medium things, like um, four or five haters jump on your social media and go, um, Danny sucks as an interviewer. And you go, whoa, that hit my stuff. Can I, be, can I be okay and not be distracted by that? That's a medium thing. And you go like the bigger things. Someone you love gets sick or you're laid off from work for extended periods of time. Those are big things. Well, we don't have to be ready for those. Let's just focus on the smaller things. If we do that long enough, we'd be able to have an evolved consciousness that's able to handle the bigger things. I like to often say that there, a lot of problems in life come from arguing with reality. Mm, love that. Where something will happen and we'll try to convince ourselves in our mind that it didn't happen or that it should be a different way. But when you accept what is, it allows you the opportunity to go do the next thing. Love that. that there's, that's such an, that's such an awesome observation. That's such an evolved, evolved level of consciousness. Because what, if you think of this in a, a mental framework and you think of different levels of consciousness or different a hierarchy of mindset, well, the lowest level of a mindset would be the victim mindset, which is it doing exactly what you're saying? They're not willing to accept reality. Instead, they go, woe is me. And look how this is happening to me. It doesn't need to be the big things. It's not, and by the way, I don't mean being a victim. This is a victim mindset. And what's crazy is some victims don't even have a victim mindset. Mm. That's amazing. And then there are people that are not victims that have a victim mindset. So it's two different things. This is a mindset, not an actual life circumstance. But that's the lowest, that's the lowest level. And above that is a pessimist who just, um, this sucks. I can't believe this is happening. And maybe it's not the woe is me, but they they gravitate towards the negative. And we know the, 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 um, the outcomes of that mindset because people with a pessimistic mindset get outperformed by optimists and optimists do the opposite. And they see opportunities instead of obstacles. And you know, we know from science and the reticular activation system and the frequency illusion is what you look for, you see more of. So if you have this negative mindset, you can see more obstacles. If you have this optimistic mindset, you'll see more opportunities. But what's really interesting of what you were just saying is all three of those levels of mindset are just not accepting reality. Mm -hmm. They're storytelling. Yeah. That's what they're doing. And if we could instead evolve our consciousness to a higher level to where instead of being a victim, a pessimist, or an optimist, we became a realist. And there's a, a term in um, psychology called radical acceptance. And I love that because it, it highlights the need for us just to understand that this is happening right now. And 
maybe we don't need to do assign extra meaning to it. Mm-hmm. Maybe we don't need to go, woe is me, or this is negative, or it's going to be fine, and just go, this is what happens. Well, because if we look at a tree right now, we don't say to ourselves, oh, that tree is this way or that way. We just say, oh, that's a tree. And then mm. we go, get on with our day. Look at you, the Buddha. The Buddha says, just tree. <laughs> that's literally, <laughs> that. that's literally, they have a saying that says, yeah. just tree. Wow. When you don't assign extra meaning to the tree and you go, um, that's a pretty tree. That's a, that's a, that's an ugly tree. That's a, that's my tree that I planted when you just like see it for what it is. So I have a. I like to use this real world example of this because I think it highlights it fairly well. At some point in your your future, near or distant, you may become uh, a young father. Are you are your dad now? Okay. Yeah. So when you do that, at some point you're probably going to be woken up, maybe for the first time, third time, or third time in a row at three a.m. to a crying baby. What goes through your mind? When you're laying in bed and you hear your baby crying, here's what the victim says. Oh my God, why is this happening? Why is my baby cry? Here's what the pe- pessimist says. Oh my God, this sucks. Now I'm not going to get any sleep. I'm going to be exhausted at work today. This sucks. God, being a dad sucks. Here's what the optimist says. They lie in bed with an awkward grin on their face and go, it's okay, my baby will stop crying. It's okay, if I just sit here for two more minutes, my baby will stop crying. What you re- recognize there is all of those, it's just storytelling, different levels of storytelling. Well, if we can rise above being a victim to a pessimist to an optimist, if we can rise to a higher level, that's called the realist. And when the baby cries at 3 a in the morning, what does the realist say? Babies cry. Go do the work. That's it. Babies cry, go take care of your baby. It's a part of life. Life is not all set up in line with the vision that you want it to. There's going to be as many instances that are not in line with the way that you want life to line up as there are that life does fall into place. Even dolphins get sunburned. Even palm trees who live in trop- have to brace for tropical storms and hurricanes. There is adversity for every living thing on planet Earth. Birds who get to fly around, amazing, still have to live in their nest and experience 35 degrees and pouring rain. That's a tough, tough day. They don't get to have, they don't have a roof. They're exposed to the elements. That's every living thing. If you're going to bring a child in this world, You're going to experience sometimes for the 15th night in a row, your baby crying in the middle of the night. That's a part of it. For you to do anything other than accept it and go do the work is you just creating drama. Mm -hmm. It's just extra storytelling. So here's the challenge. Can we all not change the thoughts? That's what people do. And they get caught up in it. And what they end up trying to do is when they're in a victim mindset, pessimist mindset or up, they try and change the thoughts with the mind that created the thoughts. That's a, that's a messy plate. That's a really crappy thing to do. What you're doing is you're now in the rapids trying to remove the bolt. You can't do that. You're drowning. You can't get into rapids and try to work on pulling the boulders out. All we're trying to do is recognize just a data point. Plot it. I'm having this thought. Where is it on that continuum? Where is it on the spectrum of pessim- of victim, pessimist, optimist, and realist? Where am I there? And over time, like anything, that awareness creates change on it by all by itself. Now there are other tools, there are other tactics, but just that level of awareness gets you to mile 25 of the marathon. Yeah, there's some other things that get you over the finish line, but that's so much of the work. And then here's where we want to get to eventually is from that victim, pessimist, optimist, realist. We're moving there. We're now accepting reality for what it is. We recognize that it's not all sunshine and rainbows. There is challenges. We're all going to get sick. At some point, you're not going to get invited to the party. Someone is going to say something negative about you on social media. You're going to be 
hungry and you're not going to have food available, like all, you're going to be stuck in traffic, all these things are going to happen. Eventually, if we become aware of this long enough, we might be able to get to a warrior mindset. And what the warrior does is they look forward to the challenges. Not only do they accept them, not only do they have that radical acceptance, they actually look forward to them and seek them out because they know those challenges is what creates evolution. It's only through hardship and challenge that we can evolve. If you have sunshine and rainbows and a brick paved road and ease and all that in your life, that creates for complacency and that makes for a weaker infrastructure. It makes for a weaker being. Hard times create hard men. Hard men create easy times. Easy times create soft men and so on. And we want to make sure that we are continuing to recognize that the warrior, the true warrior, once he dominates the dojo and no longer has a challenge there, what does the true warrior do? He doesn't stand there all happy because he's the only black belt and he's beaten everyone in the dojo. He goes out in search of a worthy foe. He goes out in search of the next challenge because he knows that that is where the growth happens. And this is the mental framework we can all work through and recognize where we are from the victim, pessimist, optimist to the realist. That's the challenge. Can we get there? If we can all get there, spend some time there, we may be able to taste what it's like to actually look forward to these challenges. What do we do as a society when we have hard times because of soft men or soft people? How do we reconcile that and how do we become harder or more in line with the warrior in itself? We recognize where we are individually. Mm. We stop laying blame on the other side of the political spectrum. We stop saying this is this soft time has been created because of other people, and we take ownership. Mm. It's on us, and we take responsibility. Responsibility means I have the ability to respond. Now, what that means is I'm not assigning blame to somebody else. It's on me, and I am going to take the ownership to make this situation better. And the way I'm going to do that is by making Think globally, act locally. It starts with you. You can't fill from an empty cup. You have to make you the most formidable human being possible. Once you have taken ownership, you are responsible for your situation. You are living the life with discipline and fortitude and doing the right things that are going to get you to where you want to be. Well, then we can go and take levels of leadership position and when we go to a levels of leadership, it's not going and finding things that you can change. It's the way we make change is by first listening, mm -hmm. listening with compassion, listening fully. So there's a level of understanding and empathy. And then we want to learn. So if we're, if we don't like the political climate, it's not, I'm going to go out there and change this. The first thing we need to do is actually listen to the other side understand the other side whether this is rules of negotiation parenting coaching or making change in policies it's all the same thing and the way it goes is you listen you learn then you help and then you lead mm. and lead is where change happens that's where you're trying to influence your way of doing something that comes after helping the other side not for your benefit but for theirs. And when you go in that level, that sequential order, that's where real change can happen. But not coming in with an iron fist, not flipping over the poker table and going my way or the highway. This is the way we can actually make the change in the world. First, by making the change for ourselves to where we are centered enough that what's happening outside isn't rattling us. If we don't get centered enough, then as we go and try to help, let's say it's with trying to make your marriage better, and if you aren't centered enough, well, then you're going to start to try to, you're going to be 
your stuff is going to get hit too easily when sensitive stuff comes up. You need to be formidable enough, not ego driven and truly have the right motives, which is I realize it's me first that needs to change. And then I can go, listen, learn, help, and then I can bring my influence. Mm -hmm. You said something in a previous podcast when I was doing research for this. You said that the best way to coach somebody when an athlete, you're coaching an athlete, could be when you take a video of them and you don't you don't say, here, change this, this, and this. You just show them the video and yeah. say, pay attention to this and let them understand themselves what they're doing wrong and come to their own conclusion themselves. What would that look like for, I don't know, like... A political issue or or something that's maybe more I don't know amorphous than coaching is and in a physical realm seems easier almost than in an ideological realm yeah how do we work with it for the ideological yeah so in in the in the athletic coaching sense if you didn't have a video right so that kind of is going to lead to the answer so if you didn't have a video available what you would ask the athlete to do is to simply pay it without pointing out negatives that's the idea because if you point out the negatives, you're asking the athlete to focus on the negative, not also pointing out the positive. Because if you do that, you're not going to create the change that you want. You're just reinforcing the positive. What you ask the athlete to do is just become aware of whatever you become aware of your, I just want you to, during this rep, just really focus on what's happening with your feet. During this rep, I really want you to focus on what's happening with your grip, not Saying what you want, not anything else. During this rep, what I really want you to focus on is your head position, your speed, your what you get it, fill in the blank. And then you model it for them. And you go, now watch how I do this. And you go, watch my feet when I do this. Watch my hands when I do this. Watch my head when I watch the speed at which I do this. Watch how I'm setting up for this shot or whatever it is. Well, that's the same way we can do it in real life is without pointing out the negative or the positive, just bring awareness to a situation and then you model the change you want to see mm. without assigning the good or the bad, which is going to just immediately tap into the ego. Either, man, I'm, I'm dope. I'm amazing. I'm the best. I'm doing it. My coach loves me. I'm going to crush this or the opposite. Um, this coach thinks I'm no good. All he thinks I'm never going to be able to do this. It's so ne like you just remove all the good and bad, right or wrong. And we're just playing with the change agent. Mm. Could you explain how you got to understand that the best way wasn't to tell someone what they did wrong, but instead yeah. show them super. Yeah. It was very, uh, very simple. Um, it's through the book, the inner game of tennis by Tim Galway. Phenomenal book that uh, it's he coaches at a very um, he understands human psychology. Mm. He understands how we're ego driven, and he understands that as you start to label things or point things out, what actually happens to the inner mechanisms of the athlete you're trying to help improve, and. Um, he does it through the prism of a elite tennis coach, but it's applicable to life and for sure any sport or athletic, but it's really about becoming better at life. Mm. Phenomenal book. It's a, um, it's not a book I would recommend athlete uh, coaches read as the first coaching book, but it would be, um, the fifth, sixth or seventh, the inner game of tennis, inner game of tennis. It's a terrible name. Um, but the inner game is a phenomenal because he, what he's recognizing is it's not about how you hold the racket. It's not about your strategy. It's about the game that you're playing inside of you. That's what we mean by the inner game. It's the mental game you're playing with yourself. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I think prior to reading your book, I was not, I didn't understand the importance of coaching if I wasn't a coach, but I realized from reading your book that we're all coaching ourselves in every moment. And so when you recommend it to coaches as the seventh book that they should read, well, 
everybody's a coach of themselves yeah, at absolutely. least. Yes. So it leads me to ask also, what are the first three books somebody should read to coach themselves? Okay. So yeah, there's a few like fundamental books. I think that everyone should read just to have a, a baseline understanding. Um, the first one would probably be um, Mindset uh, by Carol Dweck. Mm. Um, it just, if you don't have a, a baseline understanding of these two kind of binary um, mind positions of a fixed mindset and a growth mindset, you basically, you don't, you don't get to play the game. Like if you have a fixed mindset, no amount of work that you're going to do is going to make change. So you're just trying to push against uh, an immovable object. So that would certainly be the first one. Um, the next would probably be um, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Mm. It's not a coaching or mindset book, but it's essentially a um, self-betterment book that is what you realize is when you every book that's ever been written on self betterment is basically just a derivative of that book. Mm. It's incredible. Um, so that would be the the first two, um, maybe the third. And I'm I, I, if you ask me this again in a month, I'd probably have a different third. Um, but something like the obstacle is the way by Ryan Holiday. Mm. Again, really foundational and just understanding that. Listen, you're you're assigning extra meaning to these troubles or adversities or obstacles and they're not. Mm -hmm. They are not the thing that are holding you back. They might be actually the springboard that can leap you forward. So it just asks you to kind of reframe all of these seemingly challenging circumstances that we all fight or we all face on a day-to-day -day basis and um, understand that these are the things that are actually could be beneficial for us what are some of the things that you work with let you've worked with a lot of different clients over many years and so maybe in the first year you are teaching them some of the stuff we've talked about on this podcast already what about the second through fourth year and what are what are the things that you are giving them after they've already kind of um worked on the basics a lot and I, you're probably going to bring up the basics again, like being yeah. advanced is all about the basics, but yeah, I think the first thing is uh, like if, <laughs> so you asked for the later things, but the first thing is, is recognizing that there's a voice in your head. Yeah. Like that's the first one. And, um, that, that voice in your head is, um, either going to be your greatest coach or your worst critic. And just kind of recognizing like, Oh, I see how this isn't helping me. This isn't being beneficial. And it's one of the things that's so great about, hard workouts, which is what I do. Um, I, I train people really hard is physical challenges are an accelerator for mental development. Mm. We could, you know, go on a silent retreat or we could do hours of meditation or we could do a bunch of journaling, or you could sit on a couch and talk to me about your past. And it might take us days, weeks or months to get to a place where we could get in a couple hard workouts. Mm. Really? It's like, it's so there's a huge percent of the population that doesn't even recognize there's a voice in their heads. Mm -hmm. Nobody that trains the way that we train doesn't think there's a voice in their head because it screams at you during the workout. You can't not hear it. Mm -hmm. So that would be the first thing is recognizing there's a voice in your head. And then the rest becomes playing the game of where they are on their own mental journey and their own evolution. And it becomes a bunch of, tools and practices first and foremost would be reading journaling meditating breath work solitude reflection um but there's one that's is really powerful that i try to get really early on um it's not year two or three it's um month or even day two or three which is once you finish this really hard challenging workout and you're lying on the floor gasping for air and your lungs are still trying to rip through your chest and you got battery acid pumping through your veins, there's this um, tendency at that moment to go, ah, oh, gosh, I wish I had, we all do that. Gosh, I wish I, or dang, like, dang, like, I, 
I wish I had gone a little bit faster. Like, I hate this feeling like this. There's this, this moment where this, this negativity can creep in. That's a really powerful moment where I ask my athletes to reframe. Mm. And all I'm asking them to do is be proud of their effort. We can all, in hindsight, look back and go on, woulda, coulda, shoulda. You know, I, if, I, if I was to do that again, I woulda um, gone on broken on that second set. You know, gosh, I should have um, come out faster in the first round. You know, it's so easy to second guess in hindsight, because you have the answers to the test. We all can all do that. But isn't it beneficial to have that voice in the sense of now I can write that down and now that's something that I can look for in the next? Yeah, that's not what people are doing. Interesting. What Yes, what you're doing is called learning and reflecting. Mm. That's not what most people are doing. Just like we can all use our past experiences to learn and become more prepared for the future. Most people are not doing that objectively mm. they're assigning extra meaning and gone going, dang like shoot shucks damn it i'm ter-, like that that's what we want to get away from and instead the first thing we want to do is go i'm glad with my efforts because what they tell themselves at the end of that training session is going to be the thing that they tell themselves during the next one mm. So if you go, I should have put, the, I, I'm so weak. I shouldn't have, mentally, I couldn't do, like, I, what they're going to do is pull all that negativity in the next one. And instead, if they say, I'm happy with the effort I gave, I worked hard, I love this feeling, mm. I enjoy lying on the fl- floor after the workout, knowing what I just put myself through, I'm proud of putting my body and my mind through that evolution. I know I'm a more prepared human being because of what I just did. That was not easy, and I did it. Well, now going to the next workout, that's the thoughts that they're going to have, is I work hard. I put in effort. At the end of this, I'm going to be really proud. When you start to do that, you're more ready to bump into the uncomfortability. So if I ask you to hold your breath for as long as you can and you do as long as you can, there's going to be a moment it becomes really uncomfortable. Once it becomes uncomfortable, I know what's going to happen with your mind. It's going to start to play this weird game of like, you can go longer. No, you can't. This hurts too bad. You can go longer. No, you can't. This hurts too bad. This is going to, you're, what are you doing? It's going to do all of that thing where the angel and the devil are going to have the conversations. Voice one is going to be battling voice two. Voice one is the one that has all the perspective and wants to do all the good things. Voice two wants all the immediate pleasure. That's what's happening with all of us. Mm. Well, if you, at right when I say, okay, or you go as long as you can and then you breathe. You, <sighs> if you go, God, I suck. How come I couldn't, how come I couldn't stand that? And like, I could have gone longer. Well, the next time I ask you to hold your breath, you might not be able to hold your breath as long as you did the first time. And now you're getting worse. But if I go, right when you hold your breath, right when you let go, you go like, ah, oh, that was cool. I liked that. That level of discomfort was kind of exhilarating. Mm. You're going to bring that into the next thing. And that's not only about the workouts. That's any time we're facing challenges. The next time you're stuck in traffic and that voice starts doing that thing, when you have a little bit of perspective and hindsight, you go, that was kind of neat, that little battle my mind did. Yeah. That was kind of exhilarating. That was kind of interesting that I had that level of awareness that my mom was even doing that. You can go deeper, especially if you get to the point where can I relax when my voice starts doing that? Can I relax? Then you can hold your breath longer. Then you can work out harder. Then you can handle more mentally. Then when you're boss starts coming at you saying like, you know, Danny, we've seen the numbers and it doesn't seem like you're pulling your weight. Your mind all of a sudden that moment goes uncomfortable survival instinct. I feel like I'm going to can't hold my breath any longer. Instead you go, Ooh, this is that uncomfortable thing. I'm not going to fight it because as I fight it, 
I'm not, when you fight holding your breath, by the way, this is the shortcut, this is the punchline. When you fight it, you can't hold your breath longer. You have to relax in that moment. And if we can relax in the moments of adversity, then we come more able to be productive and do more. A few years ago, I went out and Chad, I, I was invited out to talk to the Navy SEALs about mental toughness, mental fitness. And they presented their methodology to me. And then I presented it to them. I was blown away by the similarities. But I was more so incredibly in curious about the one discrepancy. And that was the amount of breath work that they do. I wasn't working breath work at all at the time, and I certainly wasn't doing it with my athletes. And after that moment, that's when I was like, well, if the most elite fighting force that has ever been created in the history of humanity believes that breath work is a worthwhile endeavor, this is something that I need to at least explore. And what you recognize is what they're trying to do is be calm in the face of challenge. And that's really important because if you are not calm, you can't perform at your peak. We talked about this earlier. You're no longer in a flow state. And, you know, I was talking to these guys and I was like, what's the, you know, we went to dinner afterwards and I was like, what's the most challenging thing you went through? And there's, there's all sorts of stuff, right? There's hell week and there's the cold and there's the get sandy for five days straight and the, sh the, the chafing and the, the weird areas of their body that no one wants to be chafed in. And, you know, there's the, the, the drown proofing and the tear gas and all sorts of the weird stuff, the physically weird stuff. And they're like, the most challenging thing that we do is an evolution where we, we don on the scuba stuff and we, um, we, at night, do a scuba where we go through the San Diego Harbor and we have to find a waypoint by staring at a GPS on our watch that's two miles out. Once we find that buoy two miles out underwater, once we find that buoy underwater, we take a 90 degree right turn and we find another one that's another distance. I don't remember what the distance is, but it's another three quarters of a mile. They're like, that's the most challenging thing we've ever had to do. And that sounds so a a crazy because of the, the physical stuff. They're like, the mind games that get played while you are in complete darkness, sensory deprivation, minus being freezing, freezing, freezing cold for hours, doing nothing but staring at your watch. And then, by the way, we're going underneath the aircraft carriers in the ank that are anchored in the harbor. And you know that the great white sharks are hanging out on the other side of the aircraft carriers because there's no current that they have to fight. And you feel like you're going to swim into the open mouth of a great white shark. And then, by the way, during the evolution, something, they still to this day don't know what it is, some things bump up against you. Oh, my God. <laughs> that are bigger than a, the size of a human being. And you have to play these mind games of what are... And imagine how their heart... And if your heart races you're using up extra oxygen, you don't make it. Well, right there, you recognize that at the elite level, yes, these guys are physical specimens and they can do more physically than almost anyone. But you recognize pretty quickly that it's their ability to remain calm in the face of the many faces of the mind. They, the mind is going to go and do its thing. You're not going to stop the mind from going, there's great whites on the other th side of this thing. You're not going to stop the mind from feeling that thing that bumps you and sends you four feet off course going, what the F was that? You're not going to stop your mind from doing that. Can you become calm in the many faces of the mind? And that's what breath work can do. Breath work, first and foremost, goes instead of letting your mind be scattered, the chatter mind, which it just goes... Mind one, mind two, mind one, mind two, mind one, mind two, which again, by just a reason, mind one is the 
one that's it's goal focused. It wants the best for you. Um, it can it has fortitude and discipline and grit, and it makes the good decisions for the long term. Mine too goes, dude. Let's party. Let's let's have the ice cream. Let's have the pizza. Let's sleep in. Let's snooze. This is uncomfortable. Get the f out. And it tries to assign meaning to things to like save you. What those guys do is they have to calm that second mind and go, we're okay, this is good, and stay calm. If ever there was a analogy, a parable that we could bring to our lives, it's that. Mm. It's not usually the big physical challenges that set off us course. It's not hell week. It's not carry a boat for five miles on your head while you're sandy and cold. It's not stay awake for three days. It's not the crazy physical evolutions. It's the mental things that throw us off course. Can we stay focused on what it is, focused on our objective, focused on the task at hand? Ben, this has been an absolute pleasure. But before I let you go, I like to ask a challenge for people listening, and I feel like you won't disappoint with this one. It might be something we've already touched on, but a way for people to take the things that we've learned in this podcast and apply it to the next thing that they're doing in their day-to-day. What's a challenge you can leave people with? Yeah, um, for sure. My biggest challenge is when the next time you feel your energy change, and what I mean by that is you get a text message from your boss that says, Can we chat first thing Monday morning? When you're late for uh, a really important meeting, you plan on going through that light that's changing yellow and the car in front of you stops. You're like, ah, what? Oh my, that's a change. And when you feel that, and it's going to come from, when you start to become aware of it, it happens all the time. This is going to happen dozens of times a day. When you feel your energy change, There's a thought. Can you plot that thought on that mindset spectrum? Is that thought a victim? Is it a pessimist? Is it an optimist, realist, or warrior? Mm. So if you're stuck in traffic and that happens, do you go, fuck, like, oh my God, like rage, like you, like that guy in front, why would you, like, Blaming like that. You're blaming, you're not taking ownership. Or you go, God, now I'm going to be so late. Like pessimist. Do you go, it's okay. It's okay. The net, all the rest of the lights will be green and I'll be fine. Optimist. Do you go like, yeah, I'm running late. There's going to be people that obey traffic laws that are a little bit not in a rush. Like this is going to happen. Okay. Like this is going to realist. Or do you go, that dude just stopped in front of me. I feel my stuff getting hit. This is a chance for me to bring a level of awareness and patience for me to work on my own character, not try to change the way other people drive, but try to, for me to be calm in this moment. If we could just plot those thoughts, those data points on that continuum, then we start evolving our consciousness. Ben Bergeron, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Add Ben Bergeron on Instagram. Anywhere else we should send people? Uh, my The training platform I use is CompTrain. So we do a lot of mindset and physical training on there. Um, that is um, also on Instagram. Uh, the website is comptrain.com. Cool. Links below. Thank you so much, Ben. This did not disappoint. Thanks, Danny.